Hi there, I hope you can see and hear me because um, uh, yeah, I've been having some tiny issues with YouTube earlier today um, and I hope they are gone now, but a couple of minutes before I went to start the stream, uh, yeah, our upstream was acting up a little bit and um, so should you see any uh, stuttering or delays or something in this live stream today, I'm sorry for that. I uh, I promise I, I uh, try to do everything I can to prevent stuff like that from happening, but if it still happens, well, blame my ISP. All right, so um, I don't know where you are right now, but it's a wonderful Saturday afternoon here in Germany. Um, we had some, uh, some slight uh, thunderstorms earlier, and now it's back to being sunny, I think, and uh, that means also that it's a tiny bit too warm in this office here, because it's south-facing, and even though I engaged all the awesome blast shields to keep the sun out, it still is, um, yeah, well, a wee bit... Um, a, a wee bit uh, uh, hot and humid in here. So sorry in advance if I stumble a bit more over my uh, tongue than usual. Um, I blame this to be uh, for, 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 for this problem. <laughs> All right, so let's get started, I think. Um, those of you who have been attending these things in the past or have watched the, the uh, recordings, uh, you know probably that um, I usually do the same uh, uh, outline. <laughs> um, throughout these these broadcasts which is so first of all I tell you what I have been up to since the last broadcast then I tell you what my next steps will be uh, with regards to moving Octoprint forward um, then we have a more or less uh, shorter or longer Q&A segment and then uh, a quick wrap up so I guess let's just drive right in all right um, what I've been up to well um, pretty much only the usual, only <laughs> the usual maintenance madness and uh, work on uh, what will be 1.3.5. Um, I'm currently in the process uh, of getting things ready uh, for first RC of that version, and I really hope that I'll be able to put out uh, that one, uh, that uh, during the coming week. So I hope something around Wednesday, Thursday or so. I'm not completely sure yet. Because I still have one specific bug that I have no idea yet how it, um, yeah, well, what's the reason for that? But I would like to get it, uh, get it fixed in that version. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you watched the last episode, but I mentioned that I was um, trying to debug a rather nasty uh, issue that some people were experiencing, where cancelling took ages to complete. So they click cancel and then nothing happened and then after a while um, the cancel script actually ran and I was not able to reproduce that myself and asked for help and uh, yeah I finally got help thanks uh, Brian for that one um, because uh, yeah um, uh, Brian actually got in touch uh, had had this issue uh, himself was able to reproduce and um, uh, not only uh, help me debug throughout the possible uh, um, yeah commits basically that that might have caused it but actually pinpointed the problem so yeah awesome thanks again and this issue is now fixed in uh, in in the current maintenance branch and will also uh, be uh, going into the 1.3.5 uh, uh, release candidate the first one and of course in the final release as well um, what I also did was um, is I, I while while debugging all that stuff, I also encountered a rather nasty race condition in the in recent processing, which could lead to a recent reload. So I don't know if you know that, but if your printer um, receives something it cannot parse from uh, from from some host connected via serial, e.g. Octoprint, um, uh, where where the checksum doesn't match or something like that, it will complain back to the host in this case Octoprint to please send this line again. And then usually, once that line is sent again, stuff, um, um, yeah, stuff is fixed and and smooth and and it's smooth sailing from there on. But um, yeah, due to that race condition that I found, it could happen that um, yeah, basically the, the the firmware sent this recent request, but Octoprint had already sent the next line, and then stuff. Um, yeah, looped a while until uh, all this back and forth with please send this again, here you are, no, that's the wrong one, please send that other one again, uh, until that was fixed. So I think that should now also be out of the way. Um, and that's probably something that has been in there for ages. The timings were just never just right to reproduce. 
so I'm, I'm pretty glad to have that um, yeah to have this tackled now as well because that would have been another one of these where I would probably have um, despaired over trying to debug them when uh, a user had brought them to me but this one I actually stumbled over myself yeah, another thing I did, and you might have already seen that if you, uh, you might already have seen that on on, on Patreon, is um, I I uh, refactored the temperature inputs on the on the temperature panel in Octoprint a, a little bit, and I thought I would just show you quickly uh, how this now looks. I just have to quickly switch to the webcam first, and I had to look up how to do that, uh, not to the webcam but to the screen. See, I can't even. It's the it's the heat. All right, so uh, you should hopefully now see uh, my other screen. And uh, this is what you are used to, right? So you have here the target thing thingy, you have the set point, you have this drop down. And the issue is if you have this set to some value and uh, that is not off, and then you use these little toggles. Um, and I'm not going to do that right now because this is actually connected to a printer and I'm not going to add more heat to this room. Um, but you might have seen that if, you, if this is set to 200 and you want to set it to 205 and you click five times here, you will not get 205, but five. And this is annoying and uh, I uh, wanted to change that. The problem is that this stuff here is not compatible to these placeholders that I use there. And yeah, well, after some back and forth and thinking, I settled on this solution. So you will now have these wonderful uh, text input is still there basically looks the same the only difference is that now if you enter some value there and then go up it actually goes up like that and if you do not uh, send a new uh, if you do not increase or decrease uh, the the value for a couple of seconds it will automatically send this stuff so if you see I go to 15 I don't do anything boom it's sent you still have uh, the temperature presets that you always had and you also can still just enter a value and I don't know why it just switched back to me. Ah, I used the num block, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, let me quickly switch back there. Um, dum, 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 dum. All right, so I'm not going to use the num block now to demonstrate that, but if you just hit enter now, it will of course still also send it. So overall, I think this is uh, a better solution that should allow you to more quickly manipulate temperatures without having to uh, pull out the keyboard all the time because you now have these fancy plus minus buttons. Um, and what I also did in the meantime was change the uh, offset editor a bit, which a lot of you probably didn't even realize was there. Is What you can do here is that any temperatures that Octoprint streams to your printer from your printer G-code files, you can adjust on the fly by uh, setting some kind of um, offset here. So if from your G-code file they would now be sent a 210, it would actually send a 215 if you have this offset set here and now it would be back to a 210 because I just cleared the offset again. And I figured since this was not a, not a feature that, that everyone uses, it was okay to accept a couple more clicks here and that made it better fit here. Anyhow, that was that bit. Um, back to me. Great, now I want it to switch back and it doesn't switch back. Wonderful. Um, let's do it that way. Okay. Um, yeah, um, another thing that I did just last week was uh, I got reports that uh, some people who already have this uh, fancy new multi-material upgrade from, um, uh, from Prusa for the Prusa Mark uh, 2 and Mark 2 S's, S's plural from that you might have to figure out for yourself, sorry, um, uh, that, that those were running into issues with the G-code viewer in Octoprint because it was simply not displaying what uh, what, what uh, the G-code file contained but some weird stuff. And after some investigation it turned out that the slicer uh, producing those G-code files for some reason used some wonky line endings that shouldn't have been, shouldn't, shouldn't actually be in use now since uh, at least 10 years because those are the, the line endings that in you are, you, are in use <laughs> were the ones uh, used in the old Mac, uh, Mac OS versions that before everything turned fancy so to speak and um, yeah, so anyhow, should now work. So any one of those, uh, an, any one of you who, who has one of those multi-material upgrades coming in uh, should now be able to, yeah, be assured <laughs> that the G-Code viewer will be able to display the files just fine. Um, 
One thing I also added now is, and uh, that might be, yeah, some of you might might say finally, and some of you will say, Ugh, and for the second one, uh, second set of people uh, about that, please wait a bit, I'll explain, is um, Octoprint will now track whether it can connect to the internet. And this is simply for the reason that um, unless it does that, it will, um, yeah, do some stuff like update checking and, uh, yeah, fetching, fetching the list of plugins from the official plugin repository and so, stuff like that, um, blind as to say it won't know if that can actually succeed or not and if uh, if, if stuff is just um, disconnected enough um, then uh, something like a server startup and such can take uh, longer than it should and also produce um, some weird wonky errors in the front uh, in the in the in the nah, in the web front end and um, since this is quite annoying for people who actually do run their octoprint instances completely offline um, or need to do it occasionally I figured it was time to add some form of internet connectivity tracking uh, that allows Octoprint to know, can I connect to the net, can I not connect to the net, um, and tell some components of itself um, whether it even, makes to, it even makes sense to try to fetch stuff like update information or, um, yeah, or, or um, plug-in repository data and such, and, and such, or not. And that way, uh, yeah, basically, it don't even try it to do rather expensive operations that will just slow things down and lead to nowhere. I realized this by, uh, I implemented this, I'm not sure if realized this is, is, is the actual English correct word, uh, the actually correct English word here, though. so yeah, I implemented this by uh, uh, basically pinging the Google DNS server and this is why I said some people will not like that um, and to uh, reassure you there the whole connectivity tracking stuff is opt-in, strict opt-in. So what will happen the next time uh, after you update to Octoprint 1.3.5 or to the current maintenance branch is that you will get a little wizard uh, pop-up that asks you, is it okay, do you want this or not? And if you say you want this, you also can say, uh, but do not ping this IP, but instead please use this one that I control and that I know is up and uh, do not use anything else but this. So I hope this is a good compromise for those of you who want a bit more intelligent handling on Octoprint on Octoprint side of, of the available net, network resources and uh, also the CPU resources and, and not do stuff that are, is bound to fail. And those of you who are very privacy con conscious, which I completely understand and do not want any, any wonky stuff happening there. So uh, yeah, opt in, no questions asked, just uh, Decide for yourself if you want this feature enabled or not, and you can also always revisit this uh, decision at a later point through the settings dialog. All right, um, this was a short list of everything that I did, and it is definitely a completely incomplete list um, because GitHub currently tells me that uh, between uh, the 1.3.4 release and the current maintenance branch, there are uh, something over 130 commits. So expect uh, a huge amount of improvements and bug fixes again, and this has basically been my past month. Um, you, you might have noticed that I'm not talking about 1.4.0 right now, and uh, yeah, I'm, I, I did not get around to work on stuff like that this month at all. I'm sorry for that. I also wish I would have found the time to work on some new features, uh, or rather some, new b some of the new really big features that I want to put into this release. But um, yeah, the, the usual maintenance stuff is, was just simply too much. So yeah, and solving problems and support and stuff. So yeah. What are the next steps? Um, as I already said, I hope to get 1.3.5 RC1 uh, ready by next week, uh, for next week, within next week, better that way maybe. Um, with a ton of improvements and bug fixes. And um, once I do that, please test this release candidate and report back. I once again will put up um, a little ticket on the issue tracker that will also be linked to from the release notes and the release announcement on the Octo blog. And um, yeah, uh, uh, some more explanation on how to to do yeah how to to basically get access to those main uh, to those release candidates and and how to switch to them and stuff. Uh, this is uh, something I explained in the last episode in Octopreneur 11 which I will also link down in the, in the description once I put this video up uh, in its, in its, uh, in its um, post-processed form. 
and um, it's really easy it's something like three or four clicks and um, yeah getting feedback from you guys uh, um, that are um, open to testing these maintenance release candidates is very important for me because I cannot test every possible combination of printers firmware uh, hardware and, and whatnot under the sun here myself and um, just getting a little everything is great and or everything sucks in this in this feedback ticket is already very helpful to determine if I still have to uh, do another round of release candidates or if I can push it as a stable release so yeah test please thanks um, once I've done that uh, or, or, or basically after ne after the next week I'm going to have a vacation and I really, really, really need one because this will be the first one on this year. The past couple of months uh, and especially the past two or so months, I've pretty much been burning the candle from both ends. And I really need some time off to recharge my batteries now. So um, what I'm going to do <laughs> after, uh, over the next month mostly though, apart from this release candidate that I'm preparing now and whatever happens else in the coming week, is I'm going on a short city trip with SO, I'm going to be reading, I'm going to be gaming. Uh, as a fun fact, I just got a Switch uh, roughly a month uh, ago and um, I'm spending a lot of my free time uh, um, relaxing in, in Hyrule <laughs> in The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, which is an awesome game and I really, really, really enjoy it. Visiting friends, friends and sleeping is also on my, on my agenda, so just so you know, uh, do not expect too much uh, presence from me over the course of August because I will really be taking some time off again. Because, and this is the big, big plan, I want to be back at work with new energy and back, fr uh, back fresh and everything and, and, and hugely motivated uh, uh, come August uh, 21st or 22nd or something, whatever the Monday is. So um, that would that be. And once I'm back again, then I will see if I have to push out um, another RC for 1.3.5 or if I uh, am ready to do the stable release. So this is something we will see then, um, depending on uh, the feedback that I get from you guys. All right. Um, that was what I have been up to and I what, I uh, what I want to do next. Uh, so let's tackle the Q&A. Um, as uh, yeah, maybe as a, as a short uh, as a short uh, uh, side note, uh, those are uh, the, the questions that I'm now going to tackle are, are questions that were um, submitted in in before this broadcast through our uh, Q&A sheet for the Patreons for the patrons on Patreon. Tricky tongue twister, and. Um, I'm going to tackle a bunch of those and then I'm going to see if there's something in our live chat right now uh, for those of you who are watching this broadcast live on this uh, Saturday, July the 22nd. And uh, if there's nothing, I will continue with the, with the questions, with another bunch of questions from the Q&A sheet. And if there's something, then we will tackle that first. Okay, so let's get started, I guess. Um, chat asks, is there a way to increase the number of viewable lines in the terminal window? Um, uh, no, currently not, because this is currently a hard-coded value. Um, problem is that um, I need to keep all of these lines that I want to present there in memory. And um, so, so I have to put some, lim some limit there so that the browser doesn't crash from, from yeah, too much memory usage, basically. And 300 line, lines appear to work fine in the past, mostly. If you, um, if you stop auto-scroll, I think I have a hard limit at 1,000 lines or 1,500 or something, I don't know right now. But for the stuff that really continues scrolling through, it was always at uh, 300 lines. Um, if there is an interest to expose this, um, this value as a setting, yeah, that would be possible. Um, in that case, please uh, create a feature request. Um, so that others also can say, yeah, please do that, or no, this is a stupid idea, do something else with your time. Uh, or, also of, of course an option, yeah, cool, I like this idea, here's a pull request to do that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, it's perfectly, perfectly fine to do that, it's just something that uh, so far never was requested, because I guess um, if you really need a full lock, you can always enable the serial lock, which you should not keep enabled on most machines, because 
of the performance impact that writing that out has, but if you are debugging something or, that, or something like that and, and really need some information of exactly what goes over the line for thousands of lines, then um, the serial log is probably the best answer. But um, yeah, as I said, open a feature request. Let's see what, what everyone else th thinks about that idea. All right. Um, next question from Phil is, I've ordered the new Prusa i3 Mark II S and Quad Filament Extruder. Will this require I write a plug-in or will existing capabil cap capability handle it? Um, so, uh, as already said, at least in G-Code viewers should now be up for it, <laughs> starting with 135. Um, and everything else should already work as is in the current version 134 because um, I, um, I think back in 132 I already introduced support for shared nozzle setup. So basically what, the, what, what this multi-material upgrade will have which is you have four extruders, but they all share one nozzle and the filament just gets retracted and the other one gets pushed into the nozzle on, on a tool change, which contrary to the, the more, uh, let's say, um, uh, let's say so far more standard multi-extruder setups uh, where you have multiple nozzles uh, at an offset to each other and this offset is important in order to do stuff like uh, I hope that wasn't too loud for you. I accidentally nudged my uh, microphone uh, boom, 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 beam. That thing where my microphone is attached to. Um, and that let let me make me lose my train of thought for a second. Give me give me a moment, please. Uh, Yeah, so basically multi-material multi extruder has one shared nozzle for up to four filaments. Um, the, the classic uh, design has these offset situations and this is uh, important for stuff like calculating the filament usage correctly, visualizing stuff correctly, um, also calculating the model size correctly for this, oh my god, you're exceeding your build volume warning that you can enable, um, things like that. So. But as I said, this should already be in there since 1.3.2. And I think that is the only thing that was needed from Octoprint side and was more or less purely cosmetic of nature. Because um, in principle, even with the multi-material upgrade, what you do is you stream G-code from a file to the printer. And it's up to the printer to do with that G-code what it's supposed to do. And as long as there are no fancy G-codes in there, that take a long time by the printer to process, in which case you need to add them to the list of long running commands so that Octoprint doesn't assume your printer to have gone, gone uh, AWOL. Or some things that, I don't know, are not G-code. <laughs> um, yeah, things should be straightforward from, from Octoprint's perspective. And as I said, the cosmetic stuff should be fixed now too. So I do not have this, material, this multi-material um, upgrade myself. I don't even have the printer it uh, fits. So um, I uh, I cannot say this with 100% confidence. So um, basically from my understanding of how stuff works and how, how the firmware uh, implements this, these things and how they made, the, made, us, made their slicing process work and all that, Octoprint should now be completely able to do everything like it should without you noticing any difference to non multi material upgrade uh, printing. Uh, but um, since I cannot test this myself, should you have this multi material upgrade and run into any issues one, with 135 uh, relating to that uh, yeah, well, just open a ticket. Tell me, I will happily fix it. I'm just, uh, I just need to rely on uh, on feedback from the community on that because, yeah, well, as I said, I cannot have every bit of hardware on the market. Um, all right. So that was that question. Um, next one by Christian. Um, who says? Hello, just want to know if it is normal when I print and by error I touch the home buttons, the printer homes and stops printing without asking me confirmation. So my problem is that I'm not entirely sure which home buttons you mean there because um, the homing buttons on Octoprint's own control tab uh, should be completely disabled while a print job is, uh, is operating, is, is ongoing. Um, and I also, just to be sure, I tested this while preparing this, uh, this, this, uh, this broadcast. 
and this is still the case, so I did not break anything there. So what I'm assuming here is that you are possibly talking about some kind of homing buttons on the printer's controller unit itself, or something like that. And um, yeah, I, I, there's no way for Octoprint to prevent you to prevent anything that the controller and the firmware do with each other, because Octoprint is only is talking to the firmware, but this communication goes yeah goes on on the side, so to speak. Um, uh, it would, in theory, be possible to adjust the firmware in such a way to maybe um, try to figure out if it's currently running a stream print job or not, but that would require adjustments in the firmware on one side, and it would also require some kind of plugin in Octoprint to, um, yeah, to basically, yeah, not, not necessarily a plugin, but, but something like a specific start and stop G code. Um, yeah, to basically tell the firmware, hello, you are now receiving a, a, a streamed print and please do not um, accept any input from the user on the, on the controller that uh, relates to moving the nozzle or something like that. But uh, usually that doesn't come, um, yeah, basically with the batteries included, stuff like this is usually not built into the printers these days yet, sadly. And so, yeah. Sorry, I, if it's really the, the, the printer controller that you're talking about, then sorry, there's, this is most likely normal, even though it sucks. And it's uh, nothing that I can do anything about, I fear, because uh, I'm simply completely out of the communication loop with Octoprint with, with regards to stuff like that. It's the same if you just, yeah, basically pluck the, uh, pull the plug on your printer. I cannot prevent you from doing that. It's, yeah. All right. Um... The next question by John is, I like the dark theme of Octoprint, but some of the icons in the plugin configuration tabs don't change. What's the best way to find how to add theme support for plugins, uh, for example, the Redeem plugin? Yeah, this is a bit tricky to answer because um, so far we do not have any official theme support in Octoprint. Um, the dark theme that you can find on the plugin repository made by user Entoff is uh, basically a CSS overlay. So what it does is it um, just reskins some parts of, of Octoprint by enforcing some additional styling um, on, on them. And of course, it can only reskin those that it knows uh, exist. So uh, one approach would be to try to talk to the plugin author and uh, get them to also add additional rules for your specific plugin. Uh, but of course this does not scale that well because uh, they cannot add, add uh, specific side rules for everything under the sun. But it would probably work for the most commonly used um, plugins and also if you're nice <laughs> in asking, um, which I just assume you would be. And um, another approach would be uh, to maybe make, make, make something like this dark theme plugin or an, in general any plugins that reskin Octoprint in any way, to also attach maybe a specific class to the body tag, um, which is the most, the topmost tag of the whole uh, HTML side. Uh, HTML side, yeah, it was okay. <laughs> and which is something that you con could then as a plugin author write specific CSS rules for. So if you detect that this tag is set, um, you can write something like, uh, if my element is in a body that has this tag, then instead of what I wrote before, please uh, apply this, these rules instead. So this is something that could be done there and could also be done for anything that relies on CSS by also checking if this class is present on the body tag. Um, that's just a thought, so <laughs> so, so I'm basically, I was basically just brainstorming a bit how to solve this. Might need some further looking into, I don't know, um, maybe also something like full-fledged theme support in the future. I don't know if this is interesting to uh, the community at large. Um, but it's definitely something that is not going to happen in one fall, <laughs> just as a word of warning. So, um, yeah, I would actually maybe suggest to open a brainstorming ticket on that one um, to maybe get some plugin authors involved uh, to talk this through how best to handle that. But I think something like this specific class on the body might actually work pretty well. All right. Um, just as a side note, it's really, 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 really warm in here. <laughs> um, next question by uh, Captain Brian. Um, Captain Bry, sorry. <laughs> 
why is the extrude retract length input box on Octopin's control tab a text type and not a number type? Tell me there are cool shortcuts we can put in there apart from numbers like 10e to extrude 10 mm or 50 mm extrude Dimius Allegro to extrude 50 mm quickly. Um, yeah, I have to say you will be severely disappointed with the answer to that question. Um, yeah, there are no cool shortcuts. It's simply just me being stupid because I simply, uh, for, for some reason or not, I, I simply defined this particular input. Maybe just quickly show you which we are even talking about. Um, uh, da, 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 that one. Um, I, yeah, we are talking about that one because if you, you, you see that I can also just write regular uh, text in there and if I would now click extrude we would probably get weird errors in the back end that's, which the user wouldn't see and this stuff would not be sent to the printer because Occupant would check if this is a, is a, is a text uh, is, a, is a number or not before trying to send it to the printer but of course it's still a bit stupid that it is not um, a number input that actually forces you to input a number there if this is the only thing that it accepts. So I guess this is a, is a tiny to-do on my list to either add, add those little plus minus thingies here as well or just a regular number input. Yeah, well, <clears throat> as I said, um, you were probably a bit disappointed by this answer. <laughs> um, well, I mean, of course, down the road we could also make this fancy and accept something like arithmetic formulas or something, but I, no, not, not right now. <laughs> Okay, um, if I did not miscount this, where now? Five questions already, could it be? One, two, three, four, five. Yep, so time to maybe um, take a look into the um, live chat. See if you got any questions burning under your, under your uh, nails. But... I think nothing that was directed specifically at me to answer <laughs> because we were just uh, discussing some stuff about touchscreens and potential good uh, touchscreens to use with the, with the RPI, RPI. And Brian just said, oh, well, that was a bit of a letdown. Yeah, I said you would not like the answers. I'm really, really sorry to disappoint there. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, it was just a stupid mistake on my part. All right, so if we do not have any specific questions now in the live chat, I'll just tackle the last question that I have prepared because it was the last question in the sheet <laughs> um, and take another look at the live chat after that. Um, okay, so uh, John asked a rather leng lengthy text and uh, yeah, I'll try to read slowly so you can definitely understand it um, because I tend to be a bit too fast in these cases, I think. Uh, People keep railing on Octoprint's print time estimation being bad. It, I don't, as I think Octoprint is simply missing information to make better estimates. Even the slicer's estimates are usually off as they don't account for warm-up times and the acceleration available. Would it help the time estimation if the firmware values for acceleration ETC make it feasible to increase accuracy? I'm thinking of Redeem Replicate, since we have a plugin to edit the firmware config from the con Octoprint settings panel already, we could feed the key values to hooks that will help make better estimates, for example. A separate plugin to feed the values in by hand for the folks running something else would easily feed the same values to modify them from default. I, <laughs> yeah, and then another question, which I will do after that. Um, yeah, so actually taking these acceleration uh, and also the jerk uh, settings from the firmware into um, consideration for these time estimates that would certainly improve things by a lot because those are basically um, those are basically what is causing these uh, these these and also the slices uh, time estimates to be usually way too low because they simply uh, assume a, yeah a movement model of the printer that completely ignores physics because you cannot go from zero to 100 millimeters per second in this. And you can also not um, go around corners without decelerating a bit, uh, because once you exceed certain speeds, uh, you will just simply, yeah, the, the, the inertia will simply not let you, it's not possible. So what your printer usually does, maybe as an explanation to those of you who do not know what 
what those acceleration settings and stuff are that we are talking about here is what the printer usually does is um, it gets a set of, of, um, of movement commands from either Octoprint or from a file it directly reads from its SD and it will not immediately start executing those so it will buffer a number of them first. How big that number is and how many it will buffer first is uh, de depends largely on the firmware uh, settings, internal settings that I cannot access. Those are um, part of the configuration um, that you do before compiling it usually. And um, then it will uh, always take a number of consecutive movements from the from that buffer and take a look at them and uh, with a look at look ahead basically uh, look um, well if it if it now moves if it if the first command it has is move straight forward and the next one is do basically nearly a, a U turn so to speak in a in a very steep angle then it knows it cannot go full speed on this move because it can already see that it will completely break and reverse in the next um, in the next command right after that. So it will calculate a movement uh, pattern that will basically move first accelerate to the middle of or something of that line and then slow down again, then do the U-turn and then accelerate from there again and then whatever it has to do for the for the next and the next and the next line and all that. And usually I think it does not only look at two lines but something like four or something like that. And how it how it does this acceleration and deceleration and also some other ne some other nifty things that I personally have to admit I have not fully understood yet because I do not know how jerk settings work. I only know they influence this kind of stuff as well. Um, is that yeah for, for that it needs these these parameters, these acceleration and and other settings and these can be fe fetched from the firmware sometimes via e via uh, eeprom commands. Sometimes they can't. Sometimes they're in a weird format. Um, but they are basically essential to know how the printer will actually print something that you feed it because uh, yeah it, it simply has to has to abide uh, has to abide no has to uh, whatever it has to stick to physics so um, and um, yeah having those having access to those values and knowing how they are used in the firmware and this is the other tricky bit in this uh, would actually help to improve these in, this, these estimates that Octoprint does when you upload a file. So when you upload a file, Octoprint uh, does a full-fledged G-code analysis, uh, parses the whole file, looks how what movements are in there, tries to see how big is the model, how much filament will it use, how long will it take to print, um, things like that. And acceleration settings, uh, knowing them will help there. Um, where it won't, where those won't help, and this is just I'm I'm, I'm just saying that so so no one here now expects uh, miracles, is that um, if you upload a file and immediately start printing it, so that Octoprint did not have um, the time to take a closer look at this G code file in the first place before it started sending it to the printer, then yeah, it, it simply has no has no chance at all to be accurate here because um, and for this I would if if you didn't know if if you didn't watch yet if you didn't watch that yet I would advise you to watch um, my explanation on print time estimation and why it is tricky especially runtime print uh, print time estimation uh, in I think it was Octoprint on air number three um, I will correct this uh, and, and put a link in the description and all that if, if I'm wrong here um, uh, so there it would not help so just as, as a side note um, the problem also is, and this was where I said this is also a tricky bit, is that um, I said that the, the, the firmware will decide how it factors in these acceleration and jerk settings and whatnot into how it calculates the actual movement speeds it will perform for uh, a specific print uh, uh, movement. And um, the firmware with regards to how it does stuff like this is a complete and utter black box for Octoprint. So I do not know the firmware implementation details. I'm happy if I know if it's a Marlin, a Repetier Smoothie, a Marlin, uh, an Anet A8, some other weir weird, weird thing or something. So I'm happy already if I know stuff like this, which actually is, uh, is stuff that I can still somehow figure out but I have no idea uh, if your implementation for, if your, if your um, planner buffer uh, which is what uh, which, which which is the, what this thing is called um if how exactly that is implemented and how it factors in these settings so there will always be some kind of offset even if i factor in if even if i have these values they are accurate and i factor them in because i will probably 
factor them, factor them in, in man. This is tricky to talk today. <laughs> Uh, because I will probably do it just a little bit wrong compared to the implementation, the exact implementation in your firmware. So, uh, that much on on the um, utility of having something like that in place in Octoprint. Um, I, uh, in general, I really would like to, do, to see something like that and I've also been meaning to in general open up estimates through a hook in some way or the other so that you can replace the current implementation. Um, the problem is, as usual, I'm drowning in tasks so I haven't yet gotten around to actually do that and I have to admit that if I have to try, have to decide between there is a bug that is actually causing issues for people trying to print things and the print time estimation is slightly off, I hope you understand why I will always decide on that one. Um, so yeah, help is welcome there um, and um, having some, some hooks in place there would certainly allow to also experiment uh, for, for people with, with stuff like that. So um, if, I, uh, if, if the implementation, the stock implementation doesn't work out, then you could just, for you, then you could just install a plugin and be happy with that. So something like, I don't know if you know that you have a Marlin version, whatnot, always and always that and only that version then you could install some plugin that does the estimates perfect for especially uh, exactly that kind of uh, uh, firmware version something like this um, and that could also include something like um, uh, additional plugins that retrieve those values, values in the first place because sometimes it might be possible to retrieve them from the firmware other times it might not be possible to do that in which case you would have to rely on the user to enter them and um, yeah, so this is also something that ha we have to keep in mind there because uh, nobody will profit from um, an estimate relying on, on these uh, data points and then having the users have, uh, jump through hoops to get them in the first place. So I think something automatic would need to be um, implemented there too and across several firmware versions again, which is always a real pain in the you know where because um, there are no standards and um, every version differs just slightly and uh, yeah so I'm, I'm not saying I do not want to do that I'm only saying that um, it will be tricky there will be uh, some some stones we have to crawl out across first <laughs> uh, anyhow I would really love to see a brainstorming ticket on that to maybe discuss this a bit more um, on github uh, probably after my vacation though, um, just as a word of warning. Um, and I would also really appreciate some help in getting this actually developed because as I said, I, I these days for some reason or not, I don't know, maybe the pro project has gotten, has gotten even more popular and this is the reason I'm currently uh, drowning in, in, in maintenance tasks and project organization stuff or maybe I'm just overworked and need that vacation and after that everything will work out again yeah, I don't know but for now I really could uh, could use some help if, if you want to see this sooner rather than later then get in touch in a brainstorming ticket and let's talk about it and see how we can make it happen okay um, this brings me to uh, taking another look at the live chat and uh, Nate suggests that uh, what about a temp, temp, uh, temp fix or temporary fix, not a temperature fix, <laughs> of allowing users to define an estimate offset value, i.e. I know my warm up, warm up cooldown usually at 20 minutes, then I can set that. Yeah, this is something that actually I usually do already in my head because uh, I know that, for example, Simplify 3D usually appears to be off by something like uh, what was the last example that I saw? 20% for me, so I just add that up on top uh, in my head and then I know it's lying. Uh, by, by the way, the, the Octoprint appears to be off by exactly the same amount. Um, and um, yeah, this is something that I've also been thinking about uh, and actually what I already do is uh, Octoprint has been logging actual print time uh, versus yeah what it what it estimated in the first place printer profile specific since 120 I think 
So there's a lot of data that we even could use to calculate this thing automatically, this offset value. As usual though, I simply haven't gotten around to it yet. This is um, this is something that is really frustrating me sometimes, I have to admit, when I always have to say, yeah, I thought about that too, I just haven't gotten around to doing it. So maybe take this as an additional, if you have time, please help. <laughs> okay, um, and now I just remembered there was still uh, a tiny little uh, question that was uh, left in John's larger question. Are you still getting bothered by complaints about this, the print time test estimation being bad, or is this just over the top in your opinion? Um, I'm still getting bothered by complaints, usually by people who do not understand that this is really not a, not not such a simple problem as it seems to be at first glance. I tried a while to educate by pointing at the um, at the at the uh, Octopin on Air number three, which I did. I think it was number three, where I explained why print time estimation really can be horribly tricky, especially if you do not leave Octoprint time to take a look at your G-code file and get an idea how it looks and estimate, uh, do an estimate first. Um, but yeah, it's it's a topic that uh, I I usually get an, immediately an, an, an immediate bite reflex when I see it stop coming up somewhere. But no worries, it was fine in this specific question. Um, and no, I do not think that factoring in the accelerations is something that would be over the top. I think that it would really be a nice addition. Um, sorry, that was, uh, yeah, uh, it's just, um, yeah, something I haven't gotten around to yet. So uh, if anyone of you wants to be my guest. Uh, okay, um, another question from the live chat. Uh, have you, con oh, also by Nate, uh, have you considered data collection from users with their permission? Uh, yep. Um, I think I also mentioned this briefly in uh, whew, Octoprint episode, uh, Octoprint on Air on number 10 or something. Um, and again, this is something, of course, again, only with, with opt-in, similar to what I now did with the connectivity check. Um, I uh, probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't really go for something like print data and such, because uh, who's going to evaluate that? Um, unless, of course, we make it some kind of public data pool, but then uh, this is tricky so that, yeah, you don't want companies to basically have access to that to happily siphon it off for whatever. Um, this is something that we that we could think about down the road, how best to do that. But um, no, what I've been thinking about mostly is really just information of how many of you are running which version, <laughs> because that would really help me uh, to get a, get a better feeling about uh, the current state, for example, of a release candidate and stuff like that yeah and of course what also would always be possible is something like writing a plugin that utilizes some kind of cloud-based um, this is what was estimated this is what it actually did run for and uh, so the usual um, uh, the usual um, offset value or, or rather offset factor for this specific sorry <laughs> For this specific printer model with this specific firmware version is usually this and that, uh, this and that. Um, that would also be possible. I just uh, first would probably try to keep it local only and and just um, yeah improve stuff for people first on the on their own local setup and uh, keep anything operating in the cloud as a second thought basically uh, to be implemented. Um, Optionally, optionally, optionally. Um, yeah, because that might actually help um, people feel um, yeah in control more. I I do not want to shove something like that under people's nose. I also do not want to have something like uh, print time reporting in the in the core application because that only complicates things even more that are already really complicated. So this would be something that I would definitely want. But if I would edit, then I would edit as part of a plugin. Um, maybe a bundled one, but still a plug-in. Um, okay. Um, uh, Brian said regarding print time estimation, just preheat your bed to full temperature before hitting print. This is actually something right that I forgot. Um, what Octoprint right now is doing is that um, I think it doesn't. Um, I think it it subtracts the 
the heat the pre the heat up time uh, from what it estimates. So basically, it will when it does this this runtime estimate. Basically, uh, the the bit where it goes. Um, I now printed 10% uh, of the file and that took me one hour, so the whole file will take 10 hours. So when it does this, um, it will first, from this one hour that it took it to print this bit, it will already have subtracted the time that it waited for the printer to heat up in the beginning. If it can detect that the printer is heating up, which it usually can if you use something like an M140 or an M100 90, which is uh, blocking heat of uh, heat up of the hot end uh, and the bed, um, because in that case it will enter some uh, start counting how long it is in this blocking heat up, and once it exit, uh, the firmware says hello and now heated up. Then Octoprint will remember this time and uh, use that to to subtract the yeah the, the the heat up times. So these should never factor in into the. Uh, into the how long will it still take bit that is displayed in Octoprint, so basically what is locked under print time left. It will of course though be displayed in print time because I always want to basically have this number reflect the actual time since you pressed print. Um, it might maybe make sense to, to add some, and I actually at one point even had that but it looked horrible so I removed it again. It's something like a cleaned print time where all the heat ups and, and uh, other hold ups are distracted. I think also if you tell the printer to dwell, there's this G4 command that basically tells the printer firmware to twiddle its thumbs for a number of seconds. I think if you do that it will also subtract it but I'm not entirely sure. So yeah, maybe it would make sense to make this value to make this transparent. Um, the only problem, of course, is how to best do that so that people do not get more confused by it. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll uh, try to think about it. If, you, if any of you have any good ideas about that, of course, uh, be be free to uh, get in touch with me about it. Well, I'm slowly but steadily melting. Um, let me take another look into the live chat. Uh, yeah, I think, I think I got everything, <laughs> I hope, at least everything that is relevant to this, uh, yeah, okay. Um, uh, Nate, I will get back to your other question that is still open in the chat quickly after that. Uh, it's just something about what I, something after. Uh, this chat, what I do after, after this uh, thing, uh, this broadcast. Um, so not interesting to the rest of you. Uh, the, so let me let's let's just wrap this up. I think because we've already been um, we've already been um, uh, on this uh, nearly an hour now, uh, and. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I think my, I'm, I'm now a bit redder in the face than before. Um, <laughs> uh, the, so I really need to wrap this up now. Um, um, the next broadcast uh, will be in probably not four, but five weeks instead, because I think it does not make a lot of sense having a broadcast immediately uh, either before my vacation ends, no, 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 not going to happen, or immediately after, because I won't have gotten a lot of things done by then. Um, I'll take a look what make, makes sense there and maybe schedule it uh, maybe on the first weekend after. After all, yeah, on the first weekend after my, my first week back basically, but not in the in the in the weekend before because I, I why I expect probably some of you would even be entertained by what I would have to tell about my vacation. I actually do not want to share that openly. So um, yeah, and uh, and everything else will be just this week that I do next week, and this is probably not going to be that interesting to fill a whole hour. So, um, yeah, I guess I will probably schedule it to the for the weekend of. Oh, this would be the. Let me take a quick quickly take a look. That would be the twenty sixth, I think, August twenty sixth. Um, but um, don't nail me down on that. I'll have to take another look at my general uh, schedule to make sure that there is there are no uh, um, conflicts there. All right. Um, so with that being said, uh, I really hope that next time I will also have some. Uh, yeah, I'll be a bit less out of energy than I was today, thanks to heat and uh, sore need for a vacation. Um, 
Until then, I hope you uh, have uh, a, a nice time. Happy printing as usual. And uh, I hope to see you again in around four weeks, uh, five weeks, something like that. All right. Bye.